This morning, I want to introduce you to a man that I met in India. I was on my way to a particular destination, and I got stuck in an airport, and we were going to be there for an extra five hours. And I'm a super curious person, and I find myself sitting next to a very distinguished-looking gentleman. He has a very large, flowing, gray beard with one of those mustaches that curl up. And I was just intrigued. He caught me staring. It seems to me that people with beards just look like they know things. <laughs> and I'm attracted to people with beards. Not, not people in general, but men with beards. <laughs> and as we were sitting there, I worked up the courage to engage in a conversation with him. It was obvious to me that he was not only somebody of maturity and insight from the way he looked, but he was reading a book that I glanced over and caught a few of the words, and it was a religious book. And he was wearing some kind of distinctive religious clothing. So I worked up the courage, and I said, hey, uh, we're going to be here for quite a while, and uh, I'm just wondering, you want to have some fun and talk? He didn't smile. <laughs> he just looked at me. And I said, well, I, I have a question. I have, I, I, I'm just wondering, are, are you a religious man? And he said, yes, I'm very religious. I, I said, well, I, I, I'm just wondering, from your standpoint, you're a religious man, you believe in God? He said, yes, of course I believe in God. I said, well, if you don't mind me asking, who is God? And then he smiled. And he said, I will love to answer that question, but you have posed it wrongly. You can't ask who is God. You gotta ask what is God. I said, okay, what is God? I'm curious, what do you think? And this guy had it all prepared, seemed like he does this all the time. He said, God is G-O-D. And I'm thinking, okay. I can spell <laughs> all one-syllable words. And then he begins to expound. He said, God is generation. God is organization. And here's where it got really, really deep. God is destruction. I said, so that's it. And as he began to elaborate on his thinking, it became evident that he had encountered some of the things that we talked about last night, the kinds of things that I've encountered, chaos and pain and suffering, the kinds of things that everybody here has at least witnessed and most of you have experienced it. Everybody who's navigating through life is violated on some level at one point or another. And those violations have to be translated. They have to be worked out. They have to be processed in our thinking. They have to be slotted somewhere in our general perception of reality and what's going on in the world. And for this guy, he thought, yes, I believe in God, but God he had to relegate to an impersonal force. I asked him after he spelled this out for me, I said, so is God a person? And he said, oh my, my, my. No, God is far too ruthless to be a person. So I said, what is God? He said, well, God is the energy, the force. That, that, that is generating life and bringing it to order and then ruthlessly destroying it over and over and over again. He had encountered pain, and it was impossible for him, psychologically, maybe mostly emotionally, every worldview has behind it an attempt to process pain and suffering. And his way of processing was to say God couldn't possibly be a personal being. 
Because if God is a personal being, then the implications are that God must be a ruthless monster because of the things I've experienced in life. I mean, where was God if God is a personal being who actually gives a rip about what's going on in the world? Where was God when that happened to me? Where was God when that diagnosis came? Where was God when that tragic accident took place and innocent children were swept away in a tsunami? And so he had decided God must be an impersonal force. May the force be with you. It is one of the most popular conceptions of God going in our world. We've got to decide at the most fundamental level, either God and reality in general is fundamentally personal or impersonal. We either live in a social context and construct and we're processing and going through life in such a way that we're constantly touching and touching and touching and touching with the potential for violation or validation. Either something wondrous like free will is constantly at play and the outcome of free will is manifested all around us or we don't live in a social construct. We live in a hyper-impersonal construct. A construct of reality in which every man and woman is for him or herself. Move, follow, or get out of the way. Me, myself, and I. I just happen to be my favorite person. Step aside. Either we're living in a universe that is oriented in its ultimate trajectory toward friendship and love and good and beautiful things taking place between autonomous beings. Or we live in a universe that ultimately leads to isolation and separation and every one of us ultimately is on our own and then we vanish in to this collective force called the universe and there's nothing more to it. The Bible presents a picture of God's character that I have found to be extremely helpful, not because the Bible says it so much, now follow me, not because the Bible says this is the way it is and then I have to bow to it and yield to those declarations on the page because the Bible is exerting authority over me. Now, as a believer, I'm on the inside of that book now, so it does have authority over me. But before I'm on the inside of that book, it needs to make rational and emotional and relational sense so that I can get on the inside of that book and have it make sense for me as an authoritative source of information. So when I'm on the outside of belief in that book, I'm noticing intuitively certain things going on in the world. I'm noticing, as I shared with you last night, I'm noticing a lot of pain and chaos and relational breakdown and disintegration, and I'm noticing that in myself, I'm reacting against all of that violation and pain. I know, and nobody's told me so, but I know that there's something fundamentally wrong with relational violation. And knowing that, I also know something else. As I said last night, I knew two things growing up as a kid and into my teenage years. I knew two things, just two things, pain and love. Life was really, really hard, and there was a lot of abuse going on, and at the same time, I loved my mom with a quality of love, a kind of love that I couldn't evade. And so that love for my mother wasn't just the affection of a boy for his mom. There was an overwhelming sense of, of protection for her, an overwhelming sense of justice for her. I wanted things to be better for her. And I intuitively, at the core of my divinely crafted and engineered psyche, I knew before I ever read a line in scripture, I knew 
that this was fundamentally wrong and this is the way things ought to be. And knowing those things, then I came to the Bible and some stuff really began to make sense. Scripture, in a fascinating perspective on reality, describes God in this way. Follow the reasoning here. This is Moses writing this psalm, and he says, before the mountains were brought forth, note the word before, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world. Let's just say before creation. Pre-creation. Before any contingent creatures existed. Before human beings existed, we're contingent creatures. That means we have a point of beginning. Before that point of beginning, before creation, before the first man and the one first woman were made, before that, there is an infinite scope of reality in which there are no human beings to be found anywhere in the universe. How long were there no human beings anywhere in the universe? We can't even comprehend what it means to have an infinite scope of reality. And so we just say, before creation, before angels existed, before humans existed, Moses observes, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. This is interesting language. It's poetry for sure. Poetry has the power to access deep concepts with a minimum of words. And what's happening here is Moses is informing us that if you want to comprehend reality, you can simply divide it like this. That there is a point we call creation, that's supposed to be a C, and there is something that he's describing here as from to. From everlasting to everlasting. Let's just call this direction, let's call it eternity past. And let's call this direction in the trajectory eternity, what do you think? Future, that's right. Now, this is where you and I begin to exist. This is where the angelic order, if you believe in the existence of angels, and the Bible says that they are an order of beings that predate human beings in existence. They witnessed the creation of our world. They were there shouting for joy at our creation, Job 38 says. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, says that every child is attended by a guardian angel, so you better not mess with children, Jesus says. There are angels. There is an order of beings called angels. They predate human beings in existence, and then we came to be at some point. And that's creation. Before that, our question this morning, our question this morning is simply this. Before creation, what in the world was going on? What was happening in the universe? If God existed and he alone straddles eternity past and eternity future, if God alone, to quote Isaiah, inhabits eternity, if God alone, the Apostle Paul, has immortality in himself natural to his being, it's logical for us to ask this God, before I existed, were you bored? Before we existed, what were you doing? For all eternity past, was God twiddling his thumbs? Was he pacing the universe? Did the universe exist? Did God exist in some transcendent realm, if you can even use the word realm, that defies time, space, and matter so that the universe itself is God's creation and therefore he exists outside of it, wherever that is? So God, what were you doing for all eternity past? It's fascinating. Moses wants us to understand that God has existed for all eternity past and the Bible goes on to teach us that all of us, we have the privilege, if we so choose, to inhabit, to live 
and to occupy all of eternity future. I mean, we're minuscule compared to God with regards to our existence. But what an amazing thing when Jesus comes along and says, anyone who believes in me will never die. You'll die the first death from some physical cause, but you will never ultimately die. You'll be resurrected, and you'll just pick up where you left off and march straight into eternity future. You'll inhabit eternity future. But God, what's going on in eternity past? What's going on there? Well, interestingly enough, this is one of the most fascinating for me titles for God in Scripture. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 9 calls God the what of days? The, what's that word? Ancient. So let's just probe this for a minute. Is God old? Yes. Yeah, I mean, like, really, really old. But is God elderly, Jose? You're not sure. Does he have his teeth in a jar by the bed? Is his hairline receding? Does he have aches and pains? Does entropy have its way with God? No. If God, this is hypothetical, of course, hypothetical. If God were just to appear right now before all of us and do that thing that we sometimes do before we're 40, hey, hey, guess my age. If we just by observation were to take a look and guess God's age, we might say, I don't know, 22, 26 at the max. God is ancient. That means God has always, always existed. But God's not elderly in that God is eternally young. He experiences nothing like deterioration. He's just vibrant, eternal youth. Now, Paul blows our minds, and he says that that ancient of days, that ancient eternal past, whatever it is, was before there was something, before there was time. We can't comprehend what that means because we're time-bound creatures, aren't we? All we know is succession. This event follows the next and the next, and we're always building history behind us. Things are happening, and we are living in a linear existence. But God doesn't live in a linear existence, I guess. I guess, I guess God existed as the ancient of days before there was time. The Bible calls it eternity. Eternity past. God existed for all eternity past in some kind of non-time region of reality. And again, the question that begs to be answered, what was God doing? Ancient and eternally young, this God. When you're young, you have a lot of energy, and God's always been young. God has a lot of energy. God's active. God's curious. God's eager. God is, according to Scripture, God is creator, that means that God is, at the base of his nature, God is artistic. That means that God, who's the author of Scripture, and fully one half of Scripture is song lyrics and poetry. Many of them love songs, being sung back and forth between members of the triune God. God is creator. God is artistic. God is a God who thinks and feels and acts out the content of God's heart in creation. And as this young God exists, George MacDonald blows our minds by informing us that God was, is, and ever shall be, notice the language, divinely childlike. Childhood belongs to the divine nature. Chesterton comes along and he says, we have sinned, we have sinned and grown old and our father is younger than we are. What would you experience right now if the sin barrier was removed 
And everything that has imposed dysfunction and damage upon our psyches and our emotional makeup, and what if all of that was removed, all of it was erased, just deleted from the hard drive? And you could step into the immediate presence of God. What would you encounter? What would it be like? Well, well it would seem that in God's presence, you would encounter things like laughter and play, things like roaring laughter and the head being thrown back with joy and running not just through fields but through universe after universe after universe. What if we could step into God's presence? Would there be a smile on his face? Does God giggle? Is God truly childlike at heart? Maybe we could say it this way because we don't want to give the impression that God is immature. God is infinitely mature and eternally childlike. That's what we would experience in God's presence. It would be total, over-the-top, off-the-charts fun to be in God's presence. And he would have all kinds of ideas of what to do. And you would never be bored another nanosecond in your existence. My son Jason and I were standing with those slippery items called skis beneath our feet on top of a snow-covered mountain with a black diamond before us, about to let gravity have its way with us. Oh, I love it. And he says to me, lifting his goggles, because it was Sunday and we had just been to church, Dad, is heaven going to be like the longest church service ever? <laughs> is heaven going to be non-stop, stand still, don't move, don't say a word, be quiet, and sit down, shut up in color. It's Sabbath. Is eternity future going to be filled with boredom, or is it going to be filled with over-the-top, off-the-charts, glorious, fun in God's presence? Well, we get a picture of that by looking into eternity past. This is a series of snapshots of the character of God, the heart of God, the thinking process, the feeling process of God prior to the incarnation of Jesus, and in that sense, stretching back into eternity past. This is a song in Isaiah 42. It's a song. It's a song. And the singer in the song is God the Father, the creator of the universe, almighty, omnipotent God is the one composing the lyric and doing the singing. The topic of the song is Jesus, and the subject is the upcoming incarnation. This is written by Isaiah hundreds of years before Christ comes to the world, and this is the Father contemplating in poetry, contemplating in song the separation that's about to occur between Father and Son. And the father in this very, very emotive song says, behold, exclamation point, take this in, process this, grasp it, behold my servant. It's messianic. This is a prophecy. This is the father singing about the Jesus who's about to come to the world as our savior. Behold my servant. Now notice how the father describes the son. My servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul, say that word out loud, delights. delights. You like that word? What a word. What are synonyms for that word? Joy, happiness, pleasure? This is God the Father contemplating sending his son to the world to be our savior, and he's in an emotional moment here, and he's saying, I want you to know, humans, 
I want you to know that the one I'm sending to you, the one I'm parting with for you, is the one in whom my soul delights. I really, really like him. We've spent, in fact, all of eternity past together. I like him. I love him. We enjoy one another's company. Now, I know, compared to God, a little bit about love. I've been hanging out with the same girl since she was 13 and I was 14, and I dig this chick. And it just gets better and better and better as the days go by. And I'll tell you this. I've discovered that even on the human level, and we're just fragile, dysfunctional, messed up humans, and I'll tell you this, love is exponential. It's the only reality in circulation in the universe that grows and grows and grows and expands with exercise and has no ceiling, no floor, no walls. You can always love somebody. This is a fascinating thing about love. If you're single, I highly recommend it. You should get married, if you can, to the right person. I will tell you this. Love is amazing. You can always love somebody more than you ever have before. Ever, ever, ever. And the only reason why we can continually move into a deeper, more textured, more wonderful, beautiful love is because there must be some zenith of love out there somewhere. There must be some apex. There must be some place where the whole deal exists. And we're recipients of it and continually reciprocating with it. And that's God. God is a God who finds delight in relationships. Now, check this out. This is Jesus. I don't have time to prove to you that this is Jesus, but just as the Word, capital W in John 1, is Jesus, the wisdom, capital W, personified wisdom in Proverbs, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, 31, is Jesus. This is Jesus in Proverbs contemplating the Father now. We just read the Father contemplating his relationship with the Son. Are you with me? Now we're about to read Jesus contemplating his relationship with the, what do you think? With the Father. And Jesus says of that relationship in eternity past, check this out, Jesus says, I, that's Jesus, was beside him. The Father, as a master craftsman, they're contemplating the creation. How are we going to do it? What's it going to look like? How about a platypus? They're thinking it through. They're processing. I was beside him as a master craftsman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. This sounds super fun. And then another version New English Bible translates it, I was at his side each day, his darling and his delight. Check this out. Playing continually in his presence. Playing? Yes, playing. Another version says it this way, always enjoying his company. That's what was going on. Hey, God, what were you doing in eternity past? Ancient of days, eternally young, infinitely mature, and childlike God. What were you doing before I existed? Well, we were enjoying one another's company. We were hanging out. We were friends. And it was really, really great. This is the biblical picture of God in one snapshot after another. Check this out. Zechariah 13, 7 is the father again articulating separating from Jesus for our salvation. It's going to be a painful ordeal you pick up on in the song. And the father says, awake, O sword, that's a metaphor for the sword of justice that's going to be driven through the heart of Jesus for you and me. 
Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. And here's the part I want you to catch. This is the father talking about the son. Against the man who is my, what's the word he uses? My companion. The King James Version says my fellow. The New International Version says the one who is close to me. This is a tight relationship. When we come to the New Testament and now Jesus has come and he's incarnate in the flesh, it's no accident that the language that is used to describe his point of origin, where did he come from? Where was he before he came to this world? The language is intentionally intimate. John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared, declared him. The bosom of the Father? I have a lot of guy friends. I don't want any of them near my bosom. We don't use this kind of language. That's, that's 1940s, 1950s American talk back when dudes were bosom buddies. But it's the language of intimacy. It's a language of... You want to know where Jesus came from? You want to know where he hails from? You want to know where he was before he came here? He was in intimate fellowship with the Father and the Spirit. That's where he was. And then, incredibly, if we just ask Jesus point blank, as he comes to the end of his ministry in John 17, he is praying to the Father, and he's contemplating out loud. He's praying. He's talking to the Father. And he says, Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. Hey, Jesus, what was going on before the world was created? We were loving one another. That's what was going on. Not standing silent in one another's presence. Not bored not wondering what to do next, but just engaged in the bliss of relational intimacy. That's what we were doing. The bottom line is this. God is, as far as I can tell from Scripture and from what my very social nature as a human being tells me God must be. If I am who I am, then God is something incredible because I was made in his image. God is a social unit of other-centered bliss. God is an infinitely mature, eternally childlike friendship. And finally, God is the epicenter of all self-giving passion. What's not to like about this God? God. 